we have a sick, twisted, satanic understanding of what the word obey means. This false definition of the word obey that is so common in usage has been promoted by systems of enslavement, systems that rule by fear and by force, systems that want you to be a slave to what they demand. And so typically, when we think of the word obey, we think of shut up and do what you're told. And when we think of a commandment or a command, we think of a demand made under threat of penalty. Because that is exactly what an enslaving system, a dictatorial, tyrannical, cruel system of enslavement imposes upon you is that it makes demands under threat of penalty and it demands that you do as you're told you shut up and do what you're told you do not even ask questions because of so much of a history that we've had of being ruled by these kinds of rulers of being ruled by these kinds of systems of being ruled by these kinds of governing bodies and religious bodies and even families home life that is revolved around someone is the master and you shut up and do what the master tells you or else so we have this sick satanic idea of what obey means and it's completely false we then take that and we perform something called eisegesis which is to read into the text what isn't there so when we read in the Bible somewhere where it says obey or disobedience or obedience or any other variation of the word, we put into the text what isn't there and what isn't there is shut up and do what you're told. What isn't there is the word command meaning demand made under threat of penalty, but we put that in there. We read into the text what isn't, what isn't there. So when we see obey the commandment, we see shut up and do what you're told or pay the penalty. But that's not actually in the text. We've misdefined the words with a sick, twisted, perverse, satanic definition of those words. And in doing so, we're turning God into the devil. In doing so, we're creating a false, disgusting, satanic idol god who looks nothing like God is love. Who looks nothing like love keeps no record of wrongs. But who looks like a god of punitive measures and torture and retribution. Not a god of healing. Not a god of protection. Not a god of provision. Not a god who has your back, but a God who you had better be looking behind your back because he might be sneaking up on you. So let's take a look at where the word obey comes from. And I perhaps might mispronounce these Latin words, but that's okay. The word obey comes from a Latin word, meaning Latin word obedire, which is two different words put together. It's a compound word. You have ab and you have adire. The word ab means to see and it derives from a Latin preposition meaning toward, against, in the direction of, near, in the way of. It's the root of words such as observe and observation. We see in Matthew 28 verses 19 through 20 it says go ye therefore and teach all nations baptizing them in the name of the father and of the son and of the holy ghost teaching them to observe all things whatsoever i have commanded you and lo i am with you always even until the end of the world amen so here we have the word command and typically most people will read into the text what isn't there teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have demanded of you under threat of penalty. That's not what it says. A command is an instruction or guidance. And I even, it reminds me, to go off track a little, this idea that the word 
discipline or correct could ever have anything to do with harming or humiliating someone. So let's just say that it is correct, it is proper to correct someone when they've made a mistake. Well, correction very commonly is promoted as something that might involve some kind of harm or humiliation, some kind of physical or verbal attack against somebody. But if you have a child who's learning basic mathematics and you see give the ch child a problem of 2 plus 2 and they come up with an answer that says something other than 4, you don't correct the child by saying, you're an idiot, that's the wrong answer. You don't correct the child by wrapping it on its knuckles with a ruler. You don't correct the child by putting it in time out. You correct the child by taking two objects and two more objects and saying, here's two, here's two. If I add this one, two, and this one, two, we have one, two, three, four. Correction is to explain in a way that can be understood. Correction never involves alienation, humiliation, extermination, harm. None of those things have anything whatsoever to do with correction. Setting someone away from you is not correction. It's alienation. Telling somebody that they've drawn an erroneous conclusion is only the first step. And if you do it in a harsh manner, without tact, then you're simply attacking them. You're humiliating them. You're alienating them. If you say, now let's take a look at how you came to that conclusion and let's take a look at how we can come to a better conclusion. That's correction. Correction has nothing to do with harming somebody. So if you have a command, that command is going to be guidance. That command is going to be instruction. That command is going to help correct you And correct you is not going to be a form of harming you. Correcting you is going to be to guide you towards a better way, towards a better conclusion. So when Jesus says, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I've commanded you, he's not saying, teach people to shut up and do what they're told or face the penalty. He's saying, give instruction to people in a way that they can watch and understand. Now the second part of this word comes from a root, the AU, all, which means to perceive. It's possibly from a root meaning openly and evidently, and we'll explore something about that which might be interesting, or maybe not. But it's the root of our words audio and audit and auditory. So hearing and then also this other word audit or audition has to do with evaluating something. So it's not simply hearing but evaluating. So we see that the root of the word obey is to see, to observe, to hear, and to evaluate. Now, if we think of the definition of obey as meaning to observe, to perceive, to hear, and to evaluate, and then to base a response upon that, we come up with an entirely different concept of what obey means. And in fact, we'll see that 
shut up and do what you're told is actually disobedience. Because if you shut up and do what you're told, you're not evaluating things and responding based on that evaluation. You're blindly, ooh, that would be not seeing, doing what you're told without critical evaluation. So you're neither seeing nor auditing. If you shut up and do what you're told, you're actually doing the opposite of obeying. That's something to think about. You're not seeing. You're not observing. You're not evaluating. You are blindly, and why is that term even there? You are blindly doing what you are demanded. You are not seeing. So now let's see here. We have blind guides in Matthew 23, 1 through 13. And look at all these things that pop up as we go through these passages. Then spake Jesus to the multitude and to his disciples, saying, The scribes and the Pharisees sit in Moses' seat. All therefore whatsoever they bid you observe, that observe and do. But do not you after their works, for they say and do not. For they bind heavy burdens and grievous to be borne, and lay them on men's shoulders. That would be a yoke. But they themselves will not move them with one of their fingers. But all their works they do to be seen of men. They make broad their phylacteries and enlarge the borders of their garments. And love the uppermost rooms at feasts, and the chief seats in the synagogues, and greetings in the markets, and to be called of men, Rabbi, Rabbi. But be ye not called rabbi, for one is your master, even Christ, and all you are brethren. And call no man your father upon earth, for one is your father, which is in heaven. Neither be ye called masters, for one is your master, even Christ. But he that is greatest among you shall be your servant. I just want to pause there and reread this the way that I see it, and I think perhaps should be evaluated. Neither be called masters, for one is your master, even Christ your servant. This is completely undermining the concept of a master. The concept of a master is one who lords over you, and in fact, I think it's the Luke account of this same passage. He says something to the effect of the Gentiles' lordship over you. So what is he saying? Your master is your servant. Your master, Christ, is the one who serves you. So you don't have somebody lordshipping over you. This is the complete opposite of the idea of a master making demands that you shut up and do what you're told under threat of penalty. This is a master that says, what can I do to help you? So don't call anybody your master in the sense of lordshipping over you. Don't call anyone your master in terms of bowing down to them and saying, Yes, master, I'll do whatever you say because I don't want to face the penalty. This is saying that your true master is your servant. And whosoever shall exalt himself shall be abased, and he that shall humble himself shall be exalted. But woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you shut up the kingdom of heaven against men, for you neither go in yourselves, neither suffer you them that are entering to go in. Well, how do they shut up the heaven, kingdom of heaven against men? It's by the letter and by traditions of men. And we'll see that as we proceed. In Luke seventeen twenty to 21 this is interesting. It says, when he was demanded of the Pharisees when the kingdom of God should come, he answered them and said, the kingdom of God comes not with observation. Neither shall they say, Lo here, lo there, for behold, the kingdom of God is within you. So he's making it clear that he's not talking about a natural, earthly, geopolitical kingdom. They're saying, Hey, when are you going to overthrow the Romans and establish our government? And he's saying, That's not going to happen. The kingdom of God is here, now, and within you. But they were dull of hearing. So we see in Matthew thirteen ten to 17, it says, The disciples came and said to him, this is following the parable of the sower, 
Why do you speak to them in parables? He answered and said to them, Because it is given to you to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven. That would be the mystery of the kingdom of heaven that is within you, Christ in you, the hope of glory, Emmanuel, God with us and within us. But to them it is not given. For whosoever has, to him it shall be given, and he shall have more abundance. But whosoever has not, from him shall be taken away even that he has. Therefore I speak to them in parables. And I think even that last bit there was a bit of a parable. Because they seeing not... Because they seeing see not, and hearing they hear not, neither do they understand. And in them is fulfilled the prophecy of Isaiah, which said, By hearing you shall hear, and shall not understand, and seeing you shall see, and shall not perceive. For this, pers for this people's heart is wax gross, and their ears are dull of hearing, and their eyes they have closed, lest at any time they should see with their eyes, and hear with their ears, and should understand with their heart and should be converted, and I should heal them. But blessed are your eyes, for they see, and your ears, for they hear. For verily I say unto you that many prophets and righteous men have desired to see those things which you see, and have not seen them, and to hear those things which you hear, and have not heard them. Well, then they can't be obedient, because they're not seeing and they're not hearing. And the definition of obey is to see to listen, to evaluate, and to respond. Well, you can't do those things if you're not seeing and you're not hearing. What are they not seeing and not hearing? They're not seeing and not hearing the nature of the kingdom of God. When is it? It's at hand. Where is it? It's within you. Their eyes and ears are blind and dull to that message. So now, not only do we need to see and hear, but the next stage of obey is to audit, to test all things. In 1 Thessalonians 5, 19 through 21, we read, Quench not the spirit. Well, how would you do that? 2 Corinthians 3, 6 says, The letter kills, but the Spirit gives life. Well, you would quench the Spirit with legalism, with the law, with the letter. The letter kills, but the Spirit gives life. Quench not the Spirit. Well, that would be to follow a law. That would be to shut up and do what you're told. What would, be, what would it be to follow the Spirit? To walk in the Spirit would be to be inspired, inspirited. What it happens when you're inspired? You can't help but do the thing you're inspired to do. It pushes you. You don't push. It pushes you. It pulls you. It carries you. That's what inspired is. When you're inspired to do something, it takes effort not to do it. It doesn't take effort to do it. That's what's called motivation. That's motorvation. That means that you push in order to do something. You can't get motivated. You don't have the push to do the thing that you don't want to do because you have no inspiration to do it. What is to quench the spirit? It is to follow a rule that tells you to do things that you're not feeling moved to do. What is it to follow the Spirit? It's to do what you feel utterly compelled to do, what you feel is unstoppably driven to do. That's what it is to walk in the Spirit. And when you walk in the Spirit, there is no condemnation, because how can you be condemned for doing what you can't help but do? You can't help yourself but to do it. If we look at the parable of the sheep and the goats, what do you have? You have people on the one hand, who are driven to an act of kindness for the very sake of kindness itself. They couldn't be helped but to offer the water or to give the food or to clothe the naked. And on the other hand, you had a group of people that were only driven by the promise of reward or the threat of punishment. And they said, we didn't see what was in it for us to do such things. One was walking by the spirit. The other was walking by the flesh. The flesh that gives promise of reward and threat of punishment, which is the definition of law. That is the letter. 
The letter kills because the letter tries to drive you in order to act in a means that is contrary to the intent of your heart, whereas grace changes the intent of your heart to come into alignment with the Spirit. Verse 20, despise, despise not prophecies. Prophecy does not mean fortune-telling. It's one of the most sick, disgusting things that has been so horribly promoted by religion is this idea that prophecy is fortune-telling. Prophecy is the same root of the word. A prophet is a professor. When you go to a university, an institute of learning, you have a person called a professor who teaches you. This is a person who is an expert in the field. Prophecy is only fortune telling in as much as me telling a person who smokes habitually for 20 years, you're going to get emphysema. It is following something to its logical conclusion and saying, here's where you're going to end up if you can sit, continue in that behavior. There's no fortune telling. And I'm not saying that you might not get there's no such thing as people getting intuitions about things that they have no logical reason to know about. But prophecy is teaching. The reason Isaiah is a prophet is because he was a teacher. So it says, despise not prophecies, which is despise not teaching. Well, what would a teaching be? A teaching would potentially be something that undermines everything that you had been taught before. A teaching is something that might say something contrary to what you had been taught before, and it might even undermine the perspective that you've always held if it's sufficient in giving you new information. Isn't it interesting that religion very much promotes the idea of don't listen to these people, don't look into that, don't investigate this thing, shut your ears to that music, don't read what these people have written. What would that be? That would be despising prophecies. That would be to despise teachings, to turn your back on it, to have a faith that's so flimsy and weak that it can't withstand being tested. A faith that is so utterly flimsy and weak that when presented with information that contradicts it, you, you have to either say, la 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 la, I can't hear you, that's a trick of the devil, or you have to say, oh wow. I think maybe everything I had thought before was wrong. Perhaps you could choose instead to believe in something. Verse 21. Prove all things, hold fast that which is good. Test everything and keep that which withstands the test. In order to withstand the test, you have to be able to evaluate this contradictory information and not say, I reject it because it's contradictory and it's a trick of the devil. La 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 la, I can't hear you. It withstands the test because it actually withstands the test. So to prove all things and hold fast that which is good doesn't mean having eyes and ears that are shut off to alternative perspectives and alternative explanations and alternative lifestyles. It's very open and receptive to it. And it, me it measures them and evaluates them and says, let's see, maybe there is something of value here in this other explanation. Maybe there is something worthwhile. Maybe I'm holding on to something that isn't good. Maybe I have something that I need to discard. Maybe this isn't a trick of the devil, but rather is a refinement process that's going to make me come out the other side better. So without auditing, you're not obedient. If you're shutting your eyes and ears to other perspectives because they're a trick from the devil, you're disobedient. You're not auditing. You're not evaluating. You're not proving all things and holding fast to that which is good. You're being blind and deaf and unthinking and uncritical. That is what disobedience is. That is what the Pharisees were doing. They had shut themselves off. Pharisee means separatist. They had shut themselves off to other perspectives. They had shut themselves off from other people. And they said, we know what is right. We have it. We got the answer. The rest of you, God hates you. 
Oh, and your healing, since we don't approve of you, is obviously of the devil. And Jesus said, no, do not take a power that is exclusive to God, a power that only God has, which is the power of healing, and assign it to some rival that's trying to trick you out of your doctrine. The whole reason why this is rubbing up against your doctrine and pushing you the opposite way is because it is from God. And what you are holding on to is a tradition of men that is not from God. It's an idol. It's an invention of your own mind. It has nothing to do whatsoever with who God actually is. Galatians 1 through 3. O foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? Bewitched is blinded. O foolish Galatians, who has blinded you that you should not obey the truth? How do you obey the truth? You're going to shut up and do what the truth tells you? Under threat of penalty? What does it mean? It means to see what's going on, to observe everything, to listen and to evaluate the situation. It's to hold fast that, uh, prove all things and hold fast that which is good. You need to audit it. You need to evaluate it. But how can you when you've been blinded? Who has blinded you that you should not obey the truth before whose eyes Jesus Christ has been evidently set forth, crucified among you? This only would I learn of you. Received ye the Spirit by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith? Are you so foolish, or we could reevaluate the word foolish and say unthinking, not critically thinking something through, not evaluating? Are you so absent of evaluation? Having begun in the spirit, are you now made perfect by the flesh? Look at this. They don't see, they don't hear, and they don't evaluate. What is, that? What is the result? The result is they do not obey the truth. It's not that they don't shut up and do what they're told. It's that they're blind, they're dull of hearing, and they're uncritically thinking, not evaluating things. Shutting themselves off to other perspectives and saying, la, 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 that's a trick of the devil. You're trying to trick me out of my correct doctrine that I have because I know I've got the answer all nailed down. That's disobedience. Look at this, Colossians 2, 8 to 17. So many of the same terms coming up. Beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit after the tradition of men after the rudiments of the world and not after Christ. For in him dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily, and you are complete in him, which is the head of all principality and power, in whom you are also circumcised with the circumcision made without hands, and putting off the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ, buried with him in baptism, wherein also you are risen with him, through the faith of the operation of God, who has raised him from the dead. And you, being dead in your sins and the uncircumcision of your flesh, has he quickened together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses, blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us, and took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross. That is a very important passage there. Blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us. The letter kills, but the spirit gives life. The tradition of men is the handwriting of ordinances. The tradition of men is contrary to us because the letter kills and the spirit gives life. How do you shut up the kingdom of heaven against men with traditions of men? What does that mean? Handwriting of ordinances. Why? Because what happens when you have rules? What you have, when you have rules as your solution to a problem, you stop valuing the person and you stop evaluating the situation. That's what mandatory minimum sentencing is. It says, we don't want our judges to evaluate the situation. We want them to shut up and impose the law. What that is, is a system that wants disobedient judges in the name of obedience. 
a false, satanic, sick, perverse definition of obedience that means shut up and do what you're told instead of observe the situation, assess the situation, evaluate the situation, and respond in a way that's appropriate. That's disobedience, not obedience. Blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us, and took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross. And having spoiled principalities and powers, he made a show of them openly, triumphing over them in it. Let no man therefore judge you in meat, in drink, or in respect of a holy day, or of the new moon, or of the Sabbath days, which are a shadow of things to come, but the body is of Christ. There's so much here. He took the law and nailed it to the cross. And in doing so, he made a show openly of spoiling the principalities and powers. Why? Because he showed that the religious establishment wasn't righteous. They were bloodthirsty. He showed that they weren't godly. They were murderers. He made an open show of them, a show of them openly, because what he demonstrated was that they were more tied to their law than they were to valuing people. They didn't value life. They valued law. They valued ordinances and traditions of men that were contrary to us. So here we have in this passage, again, openly triumphing over them in it. So by being persecuted in that way, he showed what sort of people he was combating, what sort of people this conflict was against, who this religious leadership was. What if he had just fought a war against them, even if he had defeated them. Well, he'd just have been the victor in a war. But by submitting to what they wanted to do to him, he showed who they really were. He showed that they were about bloodlust. They were about bloodshed. They were about alienation. They were about humiliation. They were about exalting themselves and mistreating anyone not like themselves. Now we get to verse 16. Let no man therefore judge you in what you eat, what you drink. Let's consider any other form of consumption. Like say, smoking or inhaling something. Don't let people judge you in what you put in your body. Or in respect of a holy day, well, that would be your religious tradition. So don't let anybody judge you based on your, based on what you put in your body or your religion, or the new moon or of the Sabbath days. Isn't that interesting? It says that he made a show of the religious establishment and the principalities and powers that really were concerned with their rules and their laws and their traditions and not with the well-being of people. And then it says, don't judge people or don't let anybody judge you for what you put in your body or what religion you observe. That's got to be one of the most subversive things you could possibly say in mainstream Christianity. Don't let anybody judge you for your religion. Don't let anybody judge you for what you put into your body. And yet there it is. And what does that mean? It means those things have nothing to do with obedience because obedience has nothing to do with shut up and do what you're told. Obedience requires you to see what's going on and observe what's happening, to listen to what's being said, to listen to teachings 
even if they contradict what you've been taught before, and to evaluate the situation and hold fast to that which withstands the test. So if we're really to obey the truth of Christ, Galatians 5.1, Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty wherewith Christ has made us free, and be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. Bondage is slavery. Bondage is shut up and do what you're told. Bondage is work under one who is your master, who makes demands of you under threat of penalty. The definition of obey, as is promoted by religion, is perfectly, precisely, exactly, and I can't even think of enough words that mean to a T, on the dot, exactly the opposite of what obey actually means. And that's why I call it satanic. <laughs>